Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message today is The Prophecies of Jesus, and I will be preaching from various passages of Scripture beginning with Matthew chapter 16, if you'll turn there. I have uh, five sections to my message this morning, more like sections instead of points, and here they are. Jesus prophesied three things around his death. He prophesied his words would be around forever. He prophesied that Mary of Bethany would never be forgotten. He prophesied the abandonment of his disciples, and he prophesied his return someday. And as we come upon Resurrection Sunday in a few weeks, I was considering what messages uh, to bring to you. And it struck me that I've shared with you many prophecies about Jesus. And over the course of several years, I've mentioned a prophecy of Jesus a time or two, but I've never put together a sermon just about the prophecies of Jesus himself. You know, as we think about Jesus, we tend to think of him more as Jesus the Savior than Jesus the prophet, but he was indeed a prophet. He was a rabbi, and we don't tend to think about those things as much. And so this morning, I want to share with you the Bible prophecies recorded of, of the prophecies of Jesus. First, it's important for you to know how I view the Bible. Now, secular people just hearing my message today could easily tear it apart if they don't accept the Bible as historically accurate. You know, if you, if you just don't accept it as historically accurate, then you can just, you know, chew on it and spit it out all day long. But I do view the Bible as historically accurate and sequential. In other words, I believe that it was not written in the way that a person writes fiction. A person uh, writing fiction comes up with a plot and delivers the plot through a literary process. A person writing nonfiction records the sequence of events as they happened. When Jesus made a prediction or prophecy, and I may use the words prediction and prophecy interchangeably here, it was either written down or later fulfilled, or it was written down after, uh, after it was fulfilled. So I don't believe the writers of the scriptures took what had already happened and made up of prophecy to be entered earlier in order to make Jesus appear to be a prophet. That, that may have complicated you a little bit there. May have complicated my message just a little bit there. Uh, but all that might have been unnecessary for me to say, but there are so many skeptics out there. So in summary here, I'll be preaching from the perspective that the Bible is historically and sequentially accurate in the narrative about Jesus' prophecies and their fulfillment. In other words, Jesus prophesied it and then it happened. Something didn't just happen and someone went back and, and wrote it as if Jesus made a prophecy. And by the time we get to Matthew chapter 16, Jesus had spent quite some time with his disciples who had buried John the Baptist. They'd watched Jesus walk on water. They saw him feed thousands of people and they they heard him teach parables and they listened to him deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And now they heard something new. They heard Jesus himself prophesying. And in one scripture, Jesus prophesied three things around his death. Look in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And when the disciples heard Jesus say this, they must have wondered why. Why would religious people make Jesus suffer? Why would they do that? It just didn't make any sense to them. But we know it happened. 
And as time passed, the religious leaders felt threatened by Jesus, and they began to harass him and mock him and, and scorn him. They ridiculed him and the words that he said. And we know that they did indeed make him suffer. In verse 21, Jesus prophesied that he would die in Jerusalem, and he did just that. Mark chapter 15 and Luke 23 tells us that he was in Jerusalem. And he prophesied that the religious leaders would make him suffer right here in this verse. They did. The night that he was arrested, the religious leaders allowed him to be beaten. Luke chapter 22, verses 63, 64, and 65 records the fulfillment of that prophecy. The Bible says the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. And then in this verse, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, Jesus prophesied that he would rise again on the third day. Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And they replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body, the scripture says. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul summed it up. For what I received, I passed on to you as the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose on the third day according to the Scripture. So Jesus' prophecy there, the things about his death, they all came true. There were eyewitnesses who saw them come true. Next, Jesus prophesied that his words would be around forever. Go back, uh, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 24, several pages over. Verse 35, the scripture says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And here we are, almost 2,000 years later, discussing the words of Jesus. This was a bold prophecy of Jesus to prophesy for something for all people for all time. And when Jesus said this, the only ways to record someone's words were through a scribe or just through oral tradition, word of mouth. There was no printing press. <laughs> there was no way to store words electronically. And the likelihood of somebody's words from the first century A.D. being everlasting was about zero percent. I want you to think about something you heard from someone years ago. You probably, like I, have been impacted by the words of people many years ago. And your mind has stored those words but you know, the reality of it is, when you pass on, those words will probably die with you. And if you share them with someone else, those words will probably die with that person in that person's mind. And the, the words of the most important people of all time eventually are forgotten, or they are published in books that gather dust. They're not words that impact a majority of the people around the world on a daily basis. And look at it today with all the ways that words can be recorded. What impact do they have? When I was a kid, the Watergate scandal consumed all the media. So if you were a child during that time, you know that the only thing you could watch was Channel 8 and Sesame Street. That was it. Channel 4, 5, and 2 was Watergate. Come home from school, turn on the TV, more Watergate. The president was accused of abusing his power, including secretly recording his opponents. 
And at that time, those recordings were secret. And in time, it became known that President Nixon recorded everything. I mean, he recorded everything. He had a recorder on himself. He recorded his own conversations. And later, he said it was, uh, it was, it was just for his own keeping and just for national record and that type of thing. But everybody wondered, what, what were those words? What were those secrets? What was all that in the Watergate scandal? You know it's all online today? I think it's Nixon's tape, nixontapes.org or something. You just go there and listen to all of it. Those words that were so important all those years ago and secret are now published online for anybody around the world to hear them, and they really have zero impact on anybody today. But the words of Jesus are not just archived words like Watergate or other congressional or government or court hearings or books that have been published. They're not just archived words. They are living words that will never, ever die. That was an incredible prophecy that Jesus made, that his words would never pass away. And I stand here testifying to you that his words are right here with us. The early Jews tried to squelch the words of Jesus. Pagans tried as well. Governments through the ages have tried to stamp out the words of Jesus. And even some so-called friends of the scripture have tried to stamp out the scripture, the words of Jesus. And in the, the 1500s, there were several councils held, which later became known as the Counter-Reformation Councils. And these councils were held by the Catholic Church. And the fourth council held in Trent, Italy, declared this, that the indiscriminate circulation of Scripture in the common language of the people, which was happening at that time, would do more harm than good, and those who possess such Scriptures would not have their sins forgiven unless they handed those Scriptures over to the church. Now, I'm not here to beat up on Catholics because it's happened in the Baptist church. I can tell you today. I could take you to the churches today in Middle Tennessee in southern Kentucky where church members don't take their Bibles into the church because it's considered an insult to the preacher if you bring your Bible into the church. I see a couple of heads turning out there, but it's true. You know, if you're watching me today, I know our broadcast goes into Middle Tennessee and all Middle Tennessee, maybe Southern Kentucky. And if, if, if that's the church you attend, you might consider attending another church. Why would anyone stifle the words of Jesus? You see, I have the words of Jesus in this Bible. I can read it for myself. You have the words of Jesus in your Bible. You can read it for yourself. You don't need me to teach it to you. You have the ability to understand, comprehend, know exactly what the words of Jesus meant. And we can share that together. I would never tell you, don't bring your Bible into the church because I see it as an insult to me. How silly. What is that all about? Ignorance, I guess. But let me ask you this. How successful have all those attempts been at stopping the spreading of the words of Jesus? Well, not very. And I believe that it's a very safe assumption to state that the words of Jesus have been heard more times by more people in history than the words of anyone, anywhere, and any time in history. Next, Jesus prophesied Mary of Bethany would never be forgotten. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 11 and 13, the disciples ridiculed a woman for wasting valuable oil. There was a woman named Mary, not his mother, it was another Mary, and she poured, she poured this oil on the body of Jesus, expensive oil, in anticipation of his coming death. Listen to what the scripture says, verses 11 and 13. Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For the poor you have always with you, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume upon my body, she did so to prepare me for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Why, of all the people that Jesus knew, did he 
did he memorialize this woman in such a way? Can't you see this picture? Women who were treated as second-class citizens, really by every culture of the day, all of a sudden were elevated by Jesus. And Jesus treated women differently. And this woman who had brought this very expensive oil and poured it on Jesus, anointed him with this oil in preparation for his burial. It was all symbolic. It's, it, we don't, as Westerners, we don't think in terms of what happened there, but it was very precious what she did. And can't you just see her disciples ridiculing her? You spent too much money on that. You could have used that money to feed the poor. Can't you just hear it? And probably she just put her head down and Jesus said, I'll show them who's boss. And he said, for all time, when the gospel is preached, this woman will be remembered. And the mere fact that I'm sharing it with you this morning is fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus. Next, Jesus prophesied the abandonment of his disciples. First, there was Judas. If you look in chapter 26, verses 21 and 22, Jesus said, as they were eating, Truly I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful and began to say to him, Everyone, is it I, Lord? Who fulfilled this prophecy? Judas. Judas Iscariot. In Luke chapter 22, verses 47 and 48, we read, While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading him. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? So Jesus prophesied the abandonment of betrayal of Judas. He also prophesied the abandonment of the disciples. Right there in Matthew 26, that's a loaded chapter, by the way. If you want to focus on a chapter during the, during the weeks before Resurrection Sunday, that's the chapter to read. He prophesied the abandonment of his disciples. He said, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And later Jesus was arrested. And in verse 56, the scripture tells us that the disciples deserted him. And then Jesus also in his prophecy of the abandonment of the disciples talked about Peter. Matthew chapter 26 again, verses 33 and 34. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will, Peter said. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And this was fulfilled in verses 74 and 75. And when questioned if he was one of the disciples, Peter began to call down curses on himself and he swore to them, I don't know this man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now there are other things that Jesus prophesied that I don't have time to go into this morning. He prophesied the downfall of the, the, the Jews the destruction of Jerusalem within one generation, the destruction of the temple, the persecution and the scattering of the Jews. And then he prophesied the later coming together of the Jews to govern themselves, which we have seen happen in the last century. But there is one thing that Jesus prophesied that has not happened yet, and I'm sure you know what it is. Jesus prophesied his return someday. Look at Matthew chapter 24, which is an earlier passage. He prophesied this before the other prophecies that I shared with you. The scripture says in verse 36, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage 
up to the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken. The other will be left. Two women will be grinding in a hand mill. One will be taken. The other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus fulfilled his own prophecies about himself. The prophecies that Jesus made about other things like the Jews, the abandonment of the disciples, his word being around forever, Mary of Bethany being known forever, all those things have come to pass. So you can be guaranteed that he will fulfill the prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. Jesus will return someday. Let me ask you, will you be ready for his return. Will you be like that homeowner who if I had just known the thief was coming, I would have been prepared. Jesus is going to come when we least expect it. When the world is just going about its daily business of good things, bad things, arguing, babies being born and people dying. It's going to be an average day in the world or night. And Jesus is going to return. I really believe it could happen at any moment. Jesus said to repent and believe. What did he mean by that? He meant to repent of sin and believe that he alone is the Savior. No one else can save us for, from our sins. No one else can forgive us for our sins. Only Jesus has that power. Sure, you might wrong someone and you might say, please forgive me, and they may grant forgiveness. That's an earthly forgiveness, and it's a good thing. But there is a higher heavenly forgiveness. It's forgiveness of sin. Because we've all sinned, we've all come short of the glory of God. And Jesus is in the saving power. And I'll tell you, when holding his words right here in my hand, the other prophecies that Jesus made have been fulfilled except that one, and this one is going to be fulfilled as sure as I'm standing here today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time knowing and believing that your words are true and that everything you say will come to pass will come to pass. We want to focus our minds right now on this question about whether or not we're ready. As I looked around this morning, I saw faces of a lot of people, and I wonder if everybody here is ready. Has everyone repented of sin? Has everyone trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior? I pray that your spirit would move among us this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our altar call at this time. And if you want to come forward to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, we'll be waiting for you. We'd like to pray with you. We'd like to show you the assurance of Scripture. If you've already done that and want to let others know, we'll be waiting down front. Uh, if you'd like to become a part of us, I'll talk with you about that as well. Or you may want to come forward for some other type of prayer, maybe a prayer of healing, maybe a Oh, maybe you need a word of encouragement. Maybe you need to ask the body of Christ this morning to pray for you. Let's stand together.
Thank you for tuning in today. I hope that you'll watch again in the future. I'm Paul Gunn, pastor of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church in South Nashville. Our address is 4930 Nolensville Road. I hope that if you're in the area, you'll come by and be our guest one Sunday. Services begin at 1015 each Sunday. Some of the people who watch our telecast every week have contacted me and they tell me that they're grateful that our church produces this telecast for them. And it really is an encouragement to me when I hear that, that people are sitting in front of the television with their Bibles open and they're waiting for the program to come on. You have no idea how much of an encouragement that is to me. Listen to what the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. My question to you is, who do you believe in? Do you believe in Jesus, God's one and only Son? Jesus is the only way to God. He's the only one who can forgive us of sin. He's the only one who died on the cross for us, taking our place, paying the price for our sin, so that we would not be condemned to an eternal hell, paying for our sins. You know, in this modern world, some people may write that off as mythology, or old wives' tales, as they say. But I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I believe that the, the message of salvation is as relevant today as it was some 2,000 years ago when it was first told. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through Him. And what that means is there's an exchange that happens. Our sins are traded for eternal life. The scripture tells us, for by grace are we saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This gift of God, it's a free gift for the taking for those who will repent of sin and trust Jesus. Won't you do that today? If you've done that, call somebody you know that would be glad you made that decision and tell them that you've decided to become a follower of Christ. Find a church in your area that teaches the Bible, that preaches the Bible and lives it out and become an active member of that church and fellowship. I trust that the sermon today has been an inspiration to you and in the days ahead, you'll be thinking about it. And now may the love of the Father the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.